Hey guys, welcome to Digital Screening Channel on YouTube. And as you know, if you watched the last couple of videos, we have been focusing a bit on global average pooling layer and how we can leverage that in identifying objects of interest in our images. In fact, in the last video from the last week, we looked at anomaly detection. Well, it's a binary classification. One of the classes was like an anomaly. In our example, it was like a parasited uh, image or parasitized image showing some locations of parasites and uh, we just identified the hotspots of these parasites using our global average pooling layer and for that we set it up actually as a multi-class classification so instead of two you can extend it to multiple classes that's exactly what we are going to do here except instead of writing our own we are going to import our resnet 50 uh, that has been trained on ImageNet. So we don't have to do any training. There are 1000 classes already defined as part of ResNet 50. So here the goal is to load just some random image and generate something like what you see on the screen. Show me the object. Show me the hotspot of where this object is in yeah, this specific image. And the model contains that information because obviously it's using that information to confirm or to give us a probability for that specific uh, uh, for that specific class, all we're doing is just taking the global average pooling layer to average out all the pixel values in our feature map and get a single number, and we are going to use that and multiply that with our uh, upscaled uh, convolutional layer and that will give us a heat map if that doesn't make any sense hopefully it will in the next 10 to 15 minutes if you continue watching this video and again do not forget to subscribe to this channel and uh, like these videos because that's a good way of giving a feedback to me in terms of whether you like the content or you don't don't hit the dislike button by the way <laughs> okay let's continue let's jump into the uh, spider ide and look at the code and I said spider IDE, but it doesn't matter what IDE you use. I like this because I can see the code and I can see the variables and everything right in one screen. Okay, now let's go ahead and jump in. By the way, if uh, you know you have 1000 classes right in ResNet 50, and if you would like to know exactly what all the classes are, I'm giving you a couple of links here. Basically, they give you, I mean, you can copy the file and uh, you can get something like this, a text file. And when you print out the result, instead of printing out 19 or you know 17 you can actually type you know identify the object by its name that's the only reason that's just completely optional i like to do that that's why i downloaded this file okay with that let's go ahead and jump in most of the library should be pretty much familiar for you like numpy ast is in case you don't know it can be used to easily read the uh, uh, in in this text file that I'm, i just showed you to easily read the text and go ahead and read a bit more about this ASD. I use this to read different types of text files, especially if I don't want to uh, take care of getting those into the right format, right syntax and all that stuff. That's that. And SciPy, if you watched my last video, you know that we're going to use that to upscale the image using just our spline inter interpolation, I believe, when we go from a smaller size to a larger size. Why do we need that? To generate a heat map, we want to go from small size to an actual image size because we want we want to overlay that on our original image so for that we are going to use this so uh, don't worry about any loss in resolution by upscaling because it's not like we are trying to recreate the original image uh, it's not like a semantic segmentation it's just a heat map so we should we should be uh, okay with this type of upscaling Okay, and anything else? Uh, Matplotlib, OpenCV, and ResNet50 from Keras.applications. I'm getting both the model and also pre-process input. Obviously, we need to pre-process our images so they can be ready to be uh, fed as the input. And that's it, pillow for uh, image. So let's go ahead and run those lines. And now I have downloaded a few images. If I go back to my folder right here, as you can see, there is an agama, whatever that it looks like a lizard. Uh, a baboon, chihuahua, a few of these images. I was a bit curious in terms of how this thing maps, so I just randomly downloaded some of these images. Obviously, they belong to one of the thousand classes uh, in my image. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and load this Agama image and color in RGB. Well, if you use OpenCV, it's gonna read it as BGR, so let's convert that into RGB right there and convert that into a uh, you know a pillow object and then resize it to 224 because that's what resnet expects as input 
and convert back into numpy array and let's go ahead and show that image on the screen and proceed so let's jump into plot there you go that's the lizard that we are looking at apparently it's called a gamma okay uh, let us expand the dimensions because right now it is only 224 by 224 by 3 for us to get it ready as an input it should be 1 224 224 3 right four dimensions so let's go ahead and expand the dimensions along the axis 0 and very important pre-process the input and now we are ready with our input now let's go down and import our model so let's define our model as resnet 50 and get image net weights yeah so that's how easy it is to define our model and let's look at the summary because we completely rely on one layer global average pooling to help us out here so in uh, previously when we did bgg16 in the last video we took all the way up to the dense layer or, or the flattened layer added the global average pooling and then the final output dense layer here i'm not doing any of that because resnet 50 already contains the global average pooling layer so uh, otherwise we would have to chop the uh, model up to whatever the point and then add the global average pooling layer ourselves so let's go ahead and let me decrease the size one step so it makes it easy for us to see okay so as you can see the input all the way if i go up yeah, there you go, 224 by 224 by 3 input. So we know that. And then it goes down and go ahead and read about ResNet 50 and all that. But the thing that we are uh, curious about is right there. After the final convolutional layer right there, that's the final convolutional layer, It's there is an activation. And after that, we have global average pooling. And as you can see, when you do global average pooling, how many filters do you have here? It's 2048. And that's how many you have right here. And it's basically averaging all these 49 values within each of these 2048 filters or feature maps, if you want to call that. And that's what we get out here. So this is the input to your final predictions, which means the shape of this predictions layer is 2048 by 1000 right there. Okay, 2048 by 1000. That would be the final predictions. So what we are going to do is we're going to take that 2048 by 1000. And of those 1000, only one is our prediction. So let's take that 2048 by 1 and multiply that 2048 with the final output of the final uh, convolutional block right there. Multiply that. And not just with this, but upscaled version of this so we go from 7 by 7 to 224 by 224 so that is the plan in summary that's exactly what we are doing in the next few steps so how do we get there so first of all last layer weights what is our last layer which is the prediction layer right so let's go all the way back so this is this so last layer go ahead and get the weights Okay, if you look at last layer weights, we should have 2048 by 1000. I just mentioned that, right? I mean, we have 2048 right there, 2048 by 1000. Now we need to get the weights for the prediction for our image. So for that, first we need to predict on our image. So let's go ahead and create another model called ResNet model, where the input is going to be our input, our image input, and it's going to give us two outputs because we need these two anyhow. So why not package them into a single line? One output would be the final output that tells us exactly what class it belongs to. It should be one among 1000. The other output is model.layers minus four output. In fact, it is the output of whatever that add layer right there. In fact, you could have actually gone up here. Yeah, that's probably what I was doing. So uh, just go minus four, one, two, three, four. It's that one. Okay, so that is the output right there. Again, why? Because we are going to upscale this, upsample this, to the original image size and multiply that with that 2048 with of the winning class okay so let's define this model go ahead and define this model and when you predict using that model when you do the prediction using our input image what do you get you get two outputs one that and the other the prediction that's exactly what we are unpacking one is the last con output and the other one is predicted vector Okay, prediction vector. So let's go ahead and apply that. And as you'll see, last con output has a shape of one by seven by seven by 2048. We already know that. And the shape of our prediction vector is one by 1000. 
the maximum probability within this 1000 is the class that we would like to assign. And how do you find the maximum probability? Argmax, right? That's exactly what we'll do in a second. But first, let's get that last con output ready. I'm doing np.squeeze because the, the shape here is 1772048. When you do that, it will be 772048. So let's go ahead and do that. And as you can see up here, this is 7 by 7 by 2048. Now let's go ahead and get the prediction using the argmax. We already know that. And the prediction is prediction is number 42. Again, if you are curious what that number 42 is, that's why I have this text file. It's a gamma. We know that that's the right answer. So it's doing a great job. OK, so that's our prediction. Now that we know what the prediction is, let's go ahead and get the last convolution output. Uh, let's, let's take this one step at a time. So first of all, let's go ahead and upscale the last convolution output, 7 by 7 by 2048. We want to upscale that to 224 by 224 by 2048. How do you do that? Well, the best way is use the SciPy library. Within ND image, there is something called Zoom. All it does is spline interpolation to resize it from a small size to upper size. You need a scaling factor. And in our case, the scaling factor is what? 224, or image shape, 224, divided by the last con output, which is 7. So 224 by 7 is our scaling value, and that's exactly for uh, in both dimensions. So let's run these. And at the end of this, you would get a upsampled last con output of size 224 by 224 by 2048, and right there, you have it. Okay, next, we need to get the weights of the last uh, layer. If you again go back here, last layer weights, we have 2048 by 1000. We don't need all 1000 weights. We need the weights for the 42nd one, which is our prediction, only for that one. If you want to map, for example, how do the weights look like on this image, for a different class, go ahead and get the weights for that class. But in this case, we want to find the object that it actually detected. That's why we're getting the weights for that one. So let's go ahead and get the weights for that. And this should be just a, an array of 2048 right there. Now we are all ready to multiply this or a dot product of this with the other 224 by 224 by 2048, the upsampled image. This is our heat map. Yeah, so that's exactly what we are doing right there. We are doing this dot product. And now we have our heat map. In fact, we can go ahead and plot the heat map. That's exactly what we are doing. Here, in addition to plotting the heat map, I'm just adding whatever that class name is. And this is where my AST literal eval actually comes into picture because I'm reading this file using this library. So once I read that file, I am going to go ahead and where is my where is my uh, prediction? Prediction right there, ImageNet classes.dict. It's going to convert this into, you know, a, uh, a dictionary, for example, and then looks at 42. And the only entry that I have right there is a gamma, and it's going to print out uh, print out the a gamma when I plot it. So it's basically again predicted class. All of this here is to identify what the predicted class is. So my predicted class here will be uh, nothing but a gamma. And once I extract that, I can just go ahead and plot it along with the heat map. So let's go ahead and look at the plot. There you go. And this is the heat map for this object. Let us do the same exercise for a different image. What shall we look for? Geyser. In fact, what did not I try? I did not try baboon. I downloaded the image and I did not try it. I tried the other ones for my main screen, but let's see how this one looks like. I hope this one identifies as baboon. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Run the entire thing. Give it a second. And it's getting there. It's getting there. And let's see. I wonder if it says monkey or it's actually calling this macaque. I don't know the difference between these two. I call them all monkeys, but for those monkey experts out there, uh, <laughs> you can you can. Uh, but macaque is a type of uh, uh, of monkey anyway. So there is a high probability around the face, around the legs, and here, this part is obscured with this thing that the monkey is holding or or this macaque is holding. So that low probability right there. That's pretty good actually. I like that. And uh, let's do one more. Uh, there is a dog in park. I don't even know what breed that is. I'm not good at dog breeds, but let's see. This is another one I did not try at all. 
Okay, so it apparently is West Highland White Terrier, and you can see the hotspot again right there overlaid onto the image. So I think you got the point here. You can leverage the global average pool layer to identify the hotspots of wherever the objects of interest lie in your images. Maybe this is useful to you. Maybe you are uh, trying to create a drone that captures images, identifies uh, objects, and then you want to drive the drone to that location. Now that you have uh, coordinates, you can just device that. I just called it a drone, but it can be a microscope, it can be a telescope, it can be any of these. Just point in the direction or change the optics and zoom to that specific location. So region of interest uh, uh, is very important for us and this is a great way of actually getting, getting these hotspots. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention, guys. And again, uh, I request you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you like the type of content that you see on this channel. Thank you.